Hello, I'm Stacy Keach. Join me right now for Mysterious Places as we travel to Glastonbury, England. It's been dubbed the Isle of Avalon, one of the most mysterious and mystical places in all of England. It's been said the Holy Grail is hidden here and that King Arthur and Guinevere lie buried beneath these ruins. Some say this is a magic mountain, the place where Earth and the underworld meet. Are these mere legends conjured up over the centuries? Or is this indeed a sacred and magical place? To discover the answers, we must first experience for ourselves the mysteries of a place called Glastonbury. George Washington slept here, a refrain often connected with roadside inns throughout America. The point, of course, being that everyone wants to claim affiliation with a legendary hero. In England, that legendary figure is often King Arthur. Travel throughout the country and you'll discover many sites where King Arthur was supposed to have been born, where he fought, and where he died. While many of these claims are precarious, to say the least, others seem to have some basis in fact. This is particularly true in the town of Glastonbury, England. Glastonbury, England. Centuries ago, this town was filled with pilgrims. They came on a spiritual quest to the great abbey. Today, the Christian pilgrims still come. Only now, they are joined by other curious travelers. And though they all travel different paths, many seem to be searching for some ancient truth or knowledge. They hope to find it in this bustling market town approximately 130 miles southwest of London. We begin our own exploration of Glastonbury at the town's most striking and inspiring landmark, a 500-foot hill known as the Tor. It has been called a magic mountain and a spiral castle. It has been called the Isle of Avalon. To the Celts of the third century, Avalon was the underworld, an island containing a spiral castle. Did they believe the Tor was Avalon? Our examination of the Tor reveals striking features which match that description. In earlier eras, the Tor was actually an island and there are strange ledges in the hill which form a spiral leading up to the summit. So it's quite possible the ancients did indeed regard the Tor as the sacred land of Avalon. Local musicians Lydia Light and Oshia share this belief. They often come here to celebrate the mystical power of both the Tor and Glastonbury. It is a place where the sacred is still recognised and it's also a place where people can, in a way, get in touch with their own inner selves or with their own inner consciousness and it holds, in its legends and mysteries, it's very much the story of the grail, the chalice well, everything to do with the heart really. One of Glastonbury's greatest mysteries begins in the realm of legend. It begins with a great king, celebrated throughout the centuries, one whose very existence is a mystery. Did King Arthur really exist? And if so, what is his connection to Glastonbury? For several decades, Geoffrey Ashe has studied the legends of King Arthur. 
The story does, I think, originate with a real British king in about the late 5th century AD, which is a very mysterious time that we know very little about. A king who did some of the things Arthur is supposed to have done. But of course, most of it is legend and romance and fantasy piled on top of that. Of all the legends throughout history, those of King Arthur, his noble knights, and his fair queen, Guinevere, are among the most popular. In Glastonbury, these legends flourish. According to one local legend, Guinevere was once kidnapped by Arthur's rival, King Melvis. She was then held prisoner in a fort on the tour until Arthur rescued her. It's a dramatic and romantic story, not unlike a fairy tale. Is this merely legend, or is there some basis of truth? Today, a visit to the tour reveals the ruins of a 14th century church, but hidden beneath the surviving chapel are clues to the mystery. What is especially interesting here is that some years ago, the top of the tour was excavated, and there were buildings there. We don't know what they were, possibly a fort, possibly part of the monastery, but there was something there at about the right time, which gives support to the story. But Arthur's presence in Glastonbury reaches beyond the tour. Glastonbury Abbey, beautiful, dramatic, haunting. Today, Glastonbury Abbey is for the most part in ruins. Yet some buildings have survived time and the ravages of political tyranny. They offer the modern day pilgrim and indeed the curious a glimpse into the Abbey's illustrious past. To truly appreciate this ancient Christian center, we turn to the Abbey Museum. Here, a full scale model presents the Abbey as it probably looked at the height of its power. As it might have looked at the time our story begins. It was the 12th century AD. The abbey was one of the richest in the land, so prosperous that historians believed it could accommodate over 500 visitors. But this grand era was not to last. In 1184, a great fire devastated the abbey. When the monks began to rebuild, they made a discovery that would create a mystery that still resonates today. A grave was uncovered, and inside, they found the body of a large man with ten wounds to his skull. Beside him lay a woman and a strand of yellow hair. The grave also held a cross with an inscription. It read, Here lies buried the renowned King Arthur, in the Isle of Avalon. Was this the grave of the legendary King Arthur and his queen, or was it a hoax? Nobody quite knows what the truth about this is. Um, historians generally say that this was more or less a fake. Uh, the abbey had recently burnt down, they needed money to rebuild, and this was for prestige. However, the site has been excavated. They certainly did find an ancient grave. Uh, the problem is whether it was Arthur. Uh, and we, could, we might settle that if the cross could be found. Uh, but it's not certain where it is now. Eventually, the bodies were laid to rest in the church. Today, a sign on the abbey grounds marks this spot and serves as a timeless reminder of the connection between King Arthur and Glastonbury. When we return, the legend of the Holy Grail. Stay with us as we continue our investigation of Glastonbury, England. Here's a Mysterious Places travel tip. Glastonbury is easily accessible from London by car, bus, or train. One express bus runs daily. Trains depart from London's Paddington Station and connect to buses. Trip time is about two hours. We're back in England at Glastonbury, the Isle of Avalon. The Church of St. John stands in the center of Glastonbury. Although the origins of St. John's dates back to the 13th century, the church we see today was rebuilt in the 15th century. 
Perhaps most intriguing is this stained glass window. This is Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph's role in local legend is recalled by Leonard Sleep, a Glastonbury resident. Joseph of Arimathea was, of course, Jesus' uncle on Mary's side. And he was thought to be, or said to be, quite a rich merchant and had farming lands. Joseph, it is said, came to England a few years after the crucifixion and walked up on what is called Weary All Hill. And being Weary All, he planted his wooden staff in the ground, which subsequently grew and flourished into a Glaston, known as the Glastonbury Thorn. It's a Middle East thorn, which normally flowers and leaves in May, at the time I'm speaking but also, to some extent, has leaf and blossom at Christmas, or to be more exact, during December. And so begins Joseph of Arimathea's celebrated connection to Glastonbury. It's a connection which has endured for centuries and generated several great mysteries. First, did Joseph ever come to England? Did he plant his staff on Weary All Hill? And if so, did it indeed flourish into the holy thorn? The holy thorn, or hawthorn tree as it's commonly called, was grown in England long before Joseph could have reached these shores, and it has long played a part in legend. During the first century BC, the thorn tree was linked with a pagan goddess, and the ancient druids regarded the tree as magical. The legend of Joseph and the holy thorn actually originated in medieval times. It is, according to Patrick Riley, Vicar of St. John's, probably more symbolic than real. The truth behind that story is that what Joseph brought here, the truth of the gospel, was rooted and it grew here and it continues to blossom and flower here to this very day. And this is the important place that people want to come and witness and share in it. This is Glastonbury. Another great mystery concerning Joseph of Arimathea and Glastonbury takes us back to the Great Abbey. This was a sacred place long before the monastery was built. It's believed that in the year 38 AD, the first Christian church in England was built on this site, a church believed to have been built by Joseph of Arimathea. We're here in Glastonbury, which is one of the most ancient places in the Christian church. And this is the place where the tradition has it that Joseph of Arimathea brought the gospel, the truth about Jesus, a very few years after his death and resurrection. And this is the place where, where the old Wattle Church, which tradition has it that Joseph built, which doesn't mean that he went there with his own trowel and did it, but the, the legend has it that this is where it was centered. The monastery that developed around Joseph and the building here was in fact destroyed in the 10th century by fire. What they did was to build round it this lovely Saxon part of the church. And this was the center of the abbey, which developed in later years right out this way to this huge, huge building, which was eventually lost in the Middle Ages where, at the dissolution of the monasteries. I do believe that Joseph came here and started the first Christian church probably about 38 AD. And that site is where the Glastonbury Abbey stands, or at least now the ruins. The story of Joseph does not end here. There is one more mystery yet to probe. Some believe that when Joseph came to Glastonbury, he brought a sacred object, the cup from the Last Supper, also known as the Holy Grail. The story about the grail in Glastonbury is fascinating because you have, at one level, simply the, the, the legend of Joseph bringing here two cruets containing the sweat and the blood of Christ from the crucifixion, so to speak, the essence of his whole message symbolized in these two cruets. And then added on to that, you have this longing to find the cup. But the legend has it that the cup was brought here and put down the, the well at Chalice Well, just up the road. That's why the water comes out red, is the image. 
Did Joseph of Arimathea bring the precious grail to Glastonbury? And if so, is it hidden in the waters of the Chalice Well? Formed from a natural spring, the Chalice Well is in a sense the very lifeblood of Glastonbury. The spring has never gone dry, even in times of drought. Perhaps this helps to explain why it has always been considered a sacred place. But there's another reason, the color of the water. The water that flows from the spring is tinted red. Once again, this is attributed to Joseph of Arimathea. Legend has it that he hid the Holy Grail in the chalice well, and the waters immediately turned red, symbolic, of course, of the blood of Christ. In fact, an excavation of the well in the 1960s failed to uncover any sign of the Holy Grail. As for the red tinge, many scientists attribute it to the high iron content of the water. There is yet another mystery surrounding the Chalice Well that visitors to Glastonbury can explore. Can the waters of the Chalice Well heal the sick, as some claim? That mystery when we return. We'll be right back with Mysterious Places. We now continue with Mysterious Places. The water flows from the lion's head of the chalice well. Some say it is healing water. For many, the chalice well is a sacred place a place with unique healing powers. Every year, hundreds of people drink from these waters, hoping to reap the benefits of this power. Kathy Jones often comes to the Chalice Well to meditate and enjoy the peaceful surroundings. She is a spiritual healer and one of the founding members of the Bridget Healing Wing of Avalon University. in Chalice Well, beside the Pilgrim's Pool, which is a healing pool. The waters of Chalice Well are red, filled with iron. They flow out of the body of the earth. Traditionally, these are healing waters. In the middle of the 18th century, a man had a dream in which he was told that if he drank the waters from Chalice Well for seven Sunday, he would be cured of his asthma. He followed his dream and drank the waters and was cured. Today, that tradition continues with thousands of people coming to the Chalice Well to take the cure. Do the waters of Chalice Well really heal the sick, or is it another Glastonbury legend yet to be proven? Doreen Vipon Saddleton is among those who believes in the power of the Chalice Well. She has come all the way from London to test the waters. This is the third year we've been back, so I thought, well, my neck's been very poorly lately, so I shall try it for that. Doreen dips her hand in the water and rubs it on the pain. Like many others, she'll also take a bottle of the water home with her. She hopes it will heal her pain. Doreen says it has helped her before. Well, we came three years ago, and I was limping. I'd been limping for about three years. My right foot was really bad. And they said, we'll take you to the chalice well. It's a healing well. So they brought me, and I went, and I put my foot in this end here. And about two days after, I had no limp at all. And I've walked and walked and walked miles since. I mean, some people say it was all in the mind, you know. But it honestly did, it did heal my foot. And I've had no problems with it since. Doreen Vipon Saddleton and others believe water from the chalice well can heal. But what is the source of that healing power? Does it come from some spiritual source? Or is there a more logical explanation? So we return to Kathy Jones. In the present time, the water is a healing water that you drink. It's filled with iron. Uh, it helps to cure all those diseases that are due to a deficiency in iron. 
uh, anemia, heart diseases. The answer to this mystery, and indeed to so many mysteries in Glastonbury, seems to be poised between myth and reality. So we continue to look for truth, and in the process, remain captivated by the powerful images surrounding Glastonbury. From red water cascading down the chalice well, to the great abbey church in its ruined splendor, and finally to the tor on the hill, they remain inviting all who come to embrace the mysteries of Glastonbury. The King Arthur enthusiast can trace tales of this legendary monarch to sites all across England, from castles to forts to memorial stones. But it is in Glastonbury where these legends seem to flourish, the church, the grave, the mysterious hill. For if there is any truth to the legends of King Arthur, that truth most likely lies in the ageless spirit of Glastonbury. Until next time, I'm Stacy Keach for Mysterious Places.